Thank you very much, and thank you for extending to me the great honour of um, saying some final remarks. Am I coming across loud and clear? Yeah. Good. Um, I uh, should reassure you right now, I think it's the, uh, I'm going to butter you up by saying that I shall keep my remarks brief, um, which is unfortunate because there's a great deal to say, actually, or there would be. Um, this has been such an, a rich experience. And um, the one thing that strikes me, uh, uh, having puzzled over this 20 years ago, um, I wrote the paper 20 years ago, it was published in 1999, um, is, is that I think what, hap what has happened in the last couple of days would have been inconceivable in the 1990s, and I just want to say a few remarks um, about that. Um, I, I uh, was invited to uh, write that paper by Pamela Scheingorn, who will be known to many of you who have written on all sorts of interesting aspects of uh, late medieval culture, literature and art. <clears throat> and she said, look, you know, <clears throat> would you, we, uh, write what you like. Um, do a bully pulpit, and I chose the parish church because I had for years and years and years, actually since, since I was a boy, travelled around, um, rubbing brasses, that sort of thing. Um, uh, I'd always felt for the parish church and felt that the parish church is at the centre of my landscape, <clears throat> as well as our uh, landscape. Um, so uh, I didn't hesitate in writing this, but I wrote it. The more I wrote it, the more I became aware that... Um, uh, how difficult it is, really, to speak about uh, these buildings. As I, as I say in the, in the paper, and we've heard this re repeated today, there's just so much information. Where do you, where do you start? 9,000 circa buildings. Um, it, it, seems, it seems to defy uh, ordinary uh, uh, sort of human, um, human capability, really. Um, nevertheless, nevertheless um, one should be upbeat about this, because I want to use this uh, platform... Uh, work around to a bully pulpit myself because I've got a few things I want to say um, uh, on the theme of what next, really. Um, listening to the extraordinary range of papers, data analysis, uh, senses, uh, discussion style of, of, of liturgy, and so on, I, I, I'm very struck by um, the narrative that has emerged over the last 30 uh, years or so. And w w I suppose with retrospect, you know, you know when you're invited to sort of speak at a conference in a context like this, you know you're, you're up for the old heave-ho before, before uh, too long. But one does get a bit of perspective, and there is a kind of story here, I think. Um, I think in the late 20th century, and accelerating now, um, was a kind of rejection of the old empirical scientific Kunstwissenschaft, the old analytical way of looking at um, things, <clears throat> very intellectualist, not very sensory, um, towards a form of engagement that was really preoccupied with one thing, and that was restoring life to things. There was a sense that things needed to be brought back to life. And, and uh, the means of doing that were anthropology, performativity, materiality, environmental studies, the history of the emotions, the history of the senses, eco-criticism, um, uh, broadly a kind of social science model, uh, a kind of cultural studies model taking over from the old analytical um, art, art history model. Um, we're still, I think, on the crest of, of, of that movement. Um, and it's a trend, I think, that raises questions about what it is to understand things historically and what the object of our study is. I've listened quite hard to this uh, and to the papers, and I've sometimes asked myself, what are we really studying when we study the parish church? What is the object? Is it the thing? Well, we've heard the appeal to the study of the object, but what is the object, actually? Is it the space, the environment, our experience? Is it the surface of the building? Is it uh, the, the, so to speak, object of formal character of the building? Um, I think we've heard a number of different versions about what the study of an object is, and that right at the start, there was an appeal to get back to the study of the um, object. Um, another thing that moved me to write what I wrote in the 1990s, aside from a sense that putting life back into things somehow was important, was, was a sense that actually art history had, had in a way lost the, lost the initiative for a while. I think the great moment um, came in 1992 with the publication of Eamon Duffy's The Stripping of the Altars, which uh, is a confes confessionally positioned book. It's a point of view. It was a reaction to the old Anglican uh, understanding of the Reformation. Um, it was a brilliant book. But um, as with Eamon's uh, other books, The Voices of Morbath and so on, it has at its heart this idea that, that um, religion is a, is a form of life lived. It, gets, it absolutely goes to the heart of this um, 
this idea of getting life back into things and that religion, the vehicles of religion, the art, the images and so on and so forth, are part of a way of life that the economy and so the, the uh, social relations and so on uh, are, are defined in a sense or articulated through, um, through uh, religion. So, um, uh, uh, but, uh, what Eamon had to say, I think, was, uh, it, it was very important. Uh, it was a particular moment, and I think we have, now tr we have now got to get the initiative back, in a way. And the question is how we do it. Um, it's been quite interesting in the course of uh, the discussions uh, uh, that we've had over the last couple of days, that actually, um, if I may say so, liturgy has actually not been discussed that much. I mean, one, one obvious point to make about enlarged chancels in, in, in the 13th and 14th centuries is that they, they relate to the immense expansion of the liturgy uh, that goes on in them. Um, uh, so, I mean, in mentioning these things, I'm not picking holes and I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying that there are, there are further things to, to, to uh, react uh, to and to talk about. <clears throat> now, in my piece, what I wanted to get across was something else too. Um, I wanted to talk about engagement and performativity uh, uh, at the time. I was sort of slightly ahead of the game for once um, uh, in, in, in arguing those things. And uh, I, I made another observation right at the end, that the images and installations in parish churches, I said their colour, their technique, their expressivity. I used the expression, dare and, dare I say it, style, were constitutive elements in gestalt, always important to use a German word, um, <laughs> of late medieval art, what was moving, what provoked emotion as well as cognition. Well, there you, there you have, in a sense, that, that kind of social science um, uh, uh, agenda. Um, but I was very leery, that dare I say it style point uh, at that moment, because um, uh, I, I think this should just be said, that those of us who actually believe in the formal study of objects, and this is still extremely important, the object of our study is the, the, the formal properties of the thing. Why does it look like that? Still seems to be the question I'm most interested uh, uh, about. That had been roundly condemned as a way of uh, practising art history by the so-called new art history in the 1980s and early, early 1990s, uh, as language and discourse took over. Stylist style was deemed to be ideologically inappropriate, a sort of bourgeois delusion, you know, something you had to get over before you started studying the real um, stuff. I, of course, uh, this I think is, is nonsense. And what is interesting is how engagement with the object, one of the first things we heard, get back, I think, was it, I think it was Elite said, so let's, we have to get back to Me. the object. Huh? It was you. <laughs> <laughs> you, footnote number one. No, uh, you're not credited. Um, um, you don't deny having said this, and I agree with you. But the question is, what, what is the object of our study? And um, what I thought was this, that um, when we talk, we've heard about the senses, we've heard about light, sound, uh, all, for all five senses, we've heard about that, that sort of engagement. Th that word holism that I think came in, I remember Paul Crossley, Peter Draper, in the 1990s, there was a great deal of discussion about uh, the holistic uh, aspect of the study of the great church, not, not so much the lesser church. I wanted to break down the boundary between the lesser and the great church and, and to say, well, what would it be like to look at these buildings in a totality? But, you know, something, when you open an intellectual door and you walk through it, something follows you through that you don't necessarily want to come with you. And it's the romanticism word. We must remember that in the 19th century, we've been here before, in the 19th century, there was a doctrine and a set of practices which related all the media, music, performance, uh, 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 smell, so, uh, and it was the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art of none other than Richard Wagner. Um, uh, in, in hearing, uh, 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 as we have done, beautiful and eloquent papers about the range of experience, the range of engagement they have, I, as an historian, um, something within me uh, now says, well, when I wrote in that, in that fashion in the 1990s, I might just have been teetering on the brink of, of, of romanticism. I have to own up and own my romanticism. Um, I think we need to be careful about this. I think we need to, be, um, we need to think quite hard uh, about what language they used. Um, and in that sense, the question of anachronism and what it is that's following us through the door is, I think, an important one. I think it's a vitally important one. If we're to, if we're to keep our subject intellectually on track... Now, I'm going to say just a very few words. I'm not going to report on all, all the papers you'll be relieved to hear, I mean, I, uh, but I, I just want to pick up a few points that have come up en route 
where I think we might think uh, further. Um, and they have to do with, with um, certain sorts of word. One that came up quite early was the, the wor words mode and genre. Um, not so much style. Now, I'm struck by this word genre and concerned about it a little bit because it seems to me that in the Middle Ages, while people had quite a strong sense of hierarchy, the, their sense of genre was weaker than I think we would now allow. Um, uh, talking to literary historians, I find they say, they say the same thing. And they, um, we had a discussion about this actually a few, few weeks ago in Cambridge about this question of genre. Is the altarpiece a genre? Is the parish church a genre? Um, and the alternative of the concept that came up was the notion of family likeness. That we may, we may not think that things belong to the same genre, but they have a certain familial similarity. In other words, whether, when we think of the relation of the great church and the lesser church, it's not a question of a conflict of genre. That doesn't help us. It's not a useful concept. But it may free us if we, if we step outside of the per perimeters of, of the idea of genre to think a little bit about family -like likeness and bloodline, in a way. Um, the, the parish churches are, are related in, in a family way. The, the parish churches in the, in the Diocese of Lincoln are related in a family way to the cathedral church. It's, it's not a question of genre. It's a question of a kind of familial resemblance. We haven't quite got to the root of, what, of, 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 of that notion of familial resemblance, but I'd like to suggest that if we think a little bit about bloodline and a little bit less about the intellectualist category of genre, uh, we might get a little bit further. Um, Experience and illumination. Yeah, light. Uh, we've heard, we had two papers about light. Martin Renshaw and his team speaking um, yesterday. And uh, uh, Tom's, um, shall I say, dazzling paper on light uh, a, few minutes, a few minutes ago. Um, one, one or two things struck me about that. Um, one was that it, um, it probably mattered that the sacraments were well illuminated. And I think one thing that wasn't mentioned, and this is again the liturgical and devotional notch, the need to see is the need to see something, and, and it isn't necessarily to see liturgical books. It's the need to see, see God, uh, as it were. It's the need to see uh, the, um, the um, host and, and related things. Now, we've, we've spoken a little bit about that and the sort of spotlighting of it. But there clearly is an affective dimension to this. I don't like the word the emotions. I like the word affect. And affect is a stance or attitude towards something, as Aristotle and the rhetoricians will tell us. Um, it's a much more dynamic uh, uh, and engaged uh, way of thinking about feeling as well as uh, uh, thinking. Um, and actually, just to go back to the wonderful point that Paul uh, was making about the, the sort of reproach that this ghastly man, Mino, issues in to the Milanese, uh, or, or, and, and then, uh, the reply that your cathedral is too dark. Um, I was prodded the other day to, to go back to the documents about Girona. There's this great expertise in Girona in, in the early 15th century about building this stupendous vault across the, the, the nave of the Cathedral of Girona. Pretty southern building, brilliantly lit environment. And they say explicitly in this document, very interesting document to go back to read it, they say explicitly it's very important to have big windows, not in order that one may read, as it were, well, because it increases the jocunditas of the building. What a wonderful notion that is and how much one can get out of it. One, I mean, how that would delight Dante. The idea of, you know, face lighting up, of, of joy, of good cheer, your kunditas. It's an effective idea because, of course, it's not simply emotional. I mean, it's, an intel it's, a, it's a kind of intellective idea as, as well. Um, and it's a... Um, uh, I don't want to use the word sublime, that's an anachronistic term, but it's, it's a, a lofty idea. It, um, so uh, language matters, and using their language I think matters, because when we, when we get back to what they say, we need to ferret it out, root it out, we think hard about it, we do make a lot of um, progress. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to talk very much uh, longer, but I just wanted to pick up on a few other tiny other things. I've mentioned liturgy. Markets, I thought, um, um, we, we had a discussion um, uh, about um, Lloyd. Where's Lloyd? Is he? Oh, there you are. Right yeah. Um, the accelerating, uh, uh, so to speak, um, env and visual environment of the 14th century. I think you've, you've, you've pointed that up uh, very well. How markets are changing, how money is moving, and, and the, the, the economic basis, the, the economic basis of stylistic choices and motives, I think, is uh, is all very important. Anyway, I don't I don't want to um, it, it, it sort of drag you like a sort of groundhog day back through all papers and comment on everything because I want to end, and uh, I want to highlight a couple of what I think are essentially political 
points. And this is, it sounds like a slightly solemn way of ending, ending this, but I do think we have to go away with uplifted hearts. But we have to go away with, with, with gritted teeth and determination. The first point I want to make is, is, is this, and I say it in the context of the academy. Um, the study of parish churches will continue to flourish, principally in the academy at least, if that study can be professionally rewarded. How confident are we that in, in, in the future, PhDs and MPhils and MAs in parish church studies will be rewarded with academic positions, and that projects will be given money, that we will be able to, in, to be influential and to lead? Here, I think mobilisation and organisation matter. And I think this, is, this was an issue 20 years ago. Um, I, I remember uh, Julian Luxford very modestly said that he had been um, steered away gently from parish church studies by somebody who'd said to him, you know, is, this, is that field healthy? Well, that person was me. Um, so I had, I'd actually just written this article about the vitality and interest of the parish church, and yet in, con in, good, in, good, in good conscience, when a student came to me and I had to say, well, you know, what's, what's in your interest, not what's in the interest of the parish? It wasn't necessarily to study the parish church, and uh, the res result was a great study of the religious orders, or monastic orders, I should say, in the west of England following um, the work of Mills. So that was, bad. that was a classic instance of bad faith. But um, we have to think about how we in the academy promote and reward certain fields of subject that are related to the pressing environmental and cultural issues of the day, which brings me on to my main task. We accept, or my main point, we accept that the task of collecting data will remain formidably uh, difficult. Um, uh, and that isn't the only difficulty. It isn't simply the sheer extent of the problem. It's the, the current statutory defence of parish churches, the current political and economic environment which in the, within which these marvellous buildings uh, uh, have to um, survive, is not favourable. Uh, consider the issue of listing. I, 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 hes I hesitate to say this because I, no, I am no lawyer, but my, my, my understanding is that the con contents of parish churches are not listed in the way that the buildings are listed. I mean, this is a remarkable form. You think how much time we've given to think, thinking about, well, we didn't think about any rude screens because of this terminal date, 1399. Boy, that's all, that's all the rude screen problem. <laughs> 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 but um, seriously... Screens uh, are. Screen the screens <laughs> are part of the listing they're fixed to the building. Uh, okay, all right, you think it's fixed, but uh, okay, all right, so, so if it's a tomb, it's listed, but not if it's, uh, no. tombs are classed as listed, are they? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. But uh, anyway, what well, we need, anyway, my, my, my point is simply this, um, we, we have to create a, 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 an ideologically favourable solution for, for, for an environment for parish churches. Some will favour community solutions, but my, my, my own feeling um, is that this can't really be done without big institutional support, big projects and government. In the end, I think somebody is going to have to step in and I think it has to be government. Government has to be brought in on side. Government has to be convinced. And here, I think, flagship institutions in academe, such as the Courtauld Institute, can make and will make a difference, but only if we mobilise ourselves. So... This is a call to arms. It, we, we, it seems to me necessary to say that what, at whatever level we learn and teach, the heritage of the parish church is endangered. There's little point in studying it if we don't also fight its corner. What you have succeeded in this conference in doing is not fulfilling some agenda of research that some obscure academic set out 20 years ago. You're, you're, you're showing spontaneously, by your sheer presence here in such large numbers, what a lot of you there are, um, you're showing spontaneously how important the subject is to us, uh, uh, both institutionally, academically and nationally. And uh, that, the preservation of this is going to need, I think, a, a kind of political attention over the next generation that it has never had. So this is a call to arms. Um, uh, we, we have a few, I think we have a few ideas as to how this might be uh, handled, but um, I just think you must go, we must go away and we have to fight for this. It's, it's, uh, nobody else is going to do it, we have to do it. On which note, I will simply say thank you very much for your uh, attention. I promise not to go on too long. I'm sorry if I have rambled. But I hope, uh, I think it is all appropriate at this moment that I, I should, uh, on your behalf, first of all, uh, extend uh, our thanks to James uh, and uh, Meg for organising this, this conference. Thank you very much. Um, um,
I think we should thank the Courtauld Institute for, for, for hosting it. I think particularly um, we should thank our dear speakers who uh, have given time and energy to this and who've given, I know perfectly well listening to some of the papers, that they, these are the tips of icebergs. There's a lot going on underneath this about which we've had and which we will be hearing uh, in, 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 in the next few um, years. So would you please join me in thanking all concerned and thank you very much for your attention. Good luck, but uh, we must be vigilant. Thank you.